May only your word be spoken, O Lord. May only your word be heard. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Have you ever been walking around outside and looked up and been startled, even terrified, as you saw a hideous, almost otherworldly-looking beast staring back at you with hungry eyes and vicious teeth and razor-sharp claws, only to realize that you were, in fact, looking at a tree branch. (laughs) The tree branch didn't change, but your eyes refocus and realize that's what was happening. I wonder if something like that wasn't what happened to Peter and James and John with the transfiguration. Rather than Jesus changing before their eyes, perhaps what changed was their eyes' ability to see Jesus as he really was for a few minutes, to see the world in a way that they never had been able to before, the radiance, the majesty, the light of Jesus. Perhaps even Moses and Elijah had been there the whole time, previously unseen and unheard by Peter and James and John, until God changed something within them and allowed them to see and experience more of the world than they previously had been able to see or experience, or than we are able to with our regular senses. Perhaps Jesus took Peter and James and John up on the mountaintop in order to change something of their ability to see and experience the world for that short time so that they saw not only the majesty of Jesus, but also the majesty of God's kingdom in which those who have died are still alive and well with God and the world. Perhaps then, when God turned the dimmer switch down on Jesus, and Moses and Elijah disappeared, what they had seen on the mountain didn't cease to be, but only their ability to see it. As beautiful and wonderful as the world is then, what they saw for that short time was that the world is far more beautiful than they or we could ever have imagined. Little wonder then that they wanted to make booths and stay up on the mountain. In any mountaintop experience, any jaw-dropping, mind-blowing, beautiful experience of our lives, we tend to want to stay in that moment rather than come back down to earth and to the drudgery of daily life. As much as we like to poke fun at Peter for seemingly always saying the wrong thing, I have a feeling we would have all wanted to stay up there on that mountaintop for a little while longer as well. I wonder then how Peter and James and John saw the world once they came back down the mountain. Did the world seem dull by comparison? Maybe so but I sure hope not. I hope instead that after Jesus' transfiguration, the world seemed alight with possibility and alive with wonder. I hope they realized that everything they saw up on the mountain was still there in the regular old mundane world, just hidden from their eyes. I would say then that the only reason for any mountaintop experience, any jaw-dropping, mind-blowing, beautiful realization of the majesty of God and His kingdom all around us is to realize that it is there after the mountaintop experience as well. We're never meant to stay on top of the mountain. The only reason we go up to the mountain to see Jesus transfigured is so that we can come back down the mountain and to see Jesus in the miracle of the mundane, in the non-dopamine-laced divinity of the daily 
drudge. Every moment is a possibility. For love and wonder, every person we see is a beautiful miracle of God's design, made with the spark of God's image, and the dust of the earth of which we are all made and to which we will all one day go. And so we go up the mountain in order to come down, realizing Jesus is just as transfigured at the bottom of the mountain as at the top, even when we can't see it. Bishop Doyle writes similarly in his new book, The Jesus Heist. As he says, the only reason to come into a community for worship is so you can learn how to leave it and do the real work of worship being with Christ in the world around us. This is how we show the love of God. We go and love people, heal people, care for people, live with people, eat with people. We go and discover where Jesus is in the world and join his work there. Whether the mountain or the church service or any experience we have of the divine, we're never meant to stay. We're meant to live, and we're meant to realize that the rest of our lives are every bit as sacred, as mundane as our lives may seem at some times. Our lives and we are all a part of something bigger and far more beautiful than we can usually see or imagine. Even something as simple as a kind gesture is a sacred moment. Giving a cup of cold water to a kid who's thirsty, as Jesus taught, or even an old person who's thirsty for that matter. Going to work or to school each day at a job that does not satisfy and an education that may seem rather pointless at times taking care of aging parents or relatives, struggling to raise children with difficult challenges in their lives, wondering sometimes how you're going to make it through the month. God is there just as much on the mountaintop as he is in the miracle of the mundane. And so what is it in us then that keeps us from seeing the miracle of the mundane and the divinity of God and the daily grind? How about our wounds? How about our desires to make the world how we want it to be rather than accepting the world as it is? What if we were to give some of those wounds and desires over to God so that he might heal them and transform us so that we could see the miracle of the mundane and the divinity of the daily grind? That's kind of what Lent is all about, which we start this Wednesday, by the way. That's why we give things up during Lent. And so my suggestion is this that rather than give up something simple like Diet Coke or chocolate, try giving over to God something of your woundedness, which keeps you from seeing the miracle of the mundane. Try giving up some of your desires for control, which keep you from seeing the divinity of the daily grind. Or perhaps do try giving up something as mundane as Diet Coke or chocolate, and see the miracle of the world even in so simple a sacrifice. In any case, realize that the sacrifice, like the mountaintop, like the gathering for worship, is not the point. It's not where we stay. The sacrifice, like the mountaintop, like the community gathered in worship, is done so that we can then come back down the mountain and leave the gathering for worship and do the real work of worship. Showing the love of God by loving people and healing people, by caring for people, living with people, eating 
with people, everyday, mundane tasks. Going and discovering where Jesus is in the mundane, everyday world and joining his work there. For God is in our work, in the common work of eating and living, of caring for those we love, of struggling together as we try to raise kids and live with people we sometimes don't want to live with, of caring for people and healing people and loving people and seeing others as our brothers and sisters. That is the work where God is at the bottom of the mountain. God is in the daily grind of life. And realizing that truth, trusting that God is in the grind just as much as on the mountain, well, then we get to spend the grind in worship and in prayer, in communion with God every minute a miracle, every step a sacred act, resting in God's presence even in the mundanity of everyday life. For God is present and transfigured upon the mountain, and God is also in the grind. <laughs>